Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and this is a fascinating series on making friends for God, the joy of sharing in His mission. And this is lesson number four in that series entitled Prayer Power, Interceding for Others. This is the lesson for July 25 of 2020. As usually, we'd like to begin for, with a word of prayer. Our kind and wonderful Father, we bow before you now uh, this day to think about the, the plans you have for us, to think about what we might be able to accomplish with your help. It's really not our work, it's your work, and we just share in it. But you've asked us, you've offered, offered us the opportunity to work side by side with you, and what a glorious privilege that is. So be with us now as we study how we can do that is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. In this lesson, we will recognize the absolutely essential facts that, one, a great controversy is in progress. Two, Satan is doing everything he possibly can to thwart our plans and to misrepresent God. So how should we relate to the great controversy? One of our key weapons is prayer. The followers of Jesus were decimated when he was crucified, but hopes revived when they discovered that he had risen from the dead. So what were they to do next? The book of Acts records what happened to them over the next few weeks. Jim? As the disciples waited for the fulfillment of the promise, they humbled their hearts in true repentance and confessed their unbelief. As they called to remembrance the words that Christ had spoken to them before his death, they understood more fully their meaning. Truths which had passed from their memory were again brought to their minds, and these they repeated to one another. They reproached themselves for their misapprehension of the Savior. Like a procession, scene after scene of his wonderful life passed before them. Let me interrupt for a second. Try to imagine the disciples gathering around, and I'm sure they went just systematically through the life of Christ at the time they spent with him. Do you remember? Do you remember? Do you remember? Think of, why didn't we, re why didn't we, why didn't we? You could just hear them asking that again and again. Well, just like when he said, I'm going back to Jerusalem and, and they're going to kill me. Yeah. It, 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 could, it made no sense to them. Yeah. These days of preparation were days of deep heart searching. The disciples felt their spiritual need and cried to the Lord for the holy unction that was to fit them for the work of soul saving. They did not ask for a blessing for themselves merely. They were weighted with the burden of salvation of souls. They realized that the gospel was to be carried to the world and they claimed the power that Christ had promised. Ellen White, Excellent Apostles, page 36. Okay. What does God do when we pray? We do not begin to understand his actions, but we know that he works alongside our prayers to draw those we pray for to himself. Carrie? I'm reading from 1 John 5, verses 14 to 17. We have courage in God's presence because we are sure that he hears us if we ask him for anything that is according to his will. He hears us whenever we ask him, and since we know this is true, we know also that he gives us what we ask from him. If you see your brother or sister commit a sin that does not lead to death, you should pray to God who will give them life. This applies to those whose sins do not lead to death, but there is sin which leads to death, and I do not say that you should pray to God about that. All wrongdoing is sin, but there is sin which does not lead to death. It's American wow. Bible Society, the Holy Bible. Good news translation. That is a, that is a mind boggler, isn't it? Yeah. So, can we understand what John was trying to tell us there? It would be impossible to understand how God answers our prayers when we pray for others without a clear understanding of the great controversy. That controversy, of course, began in heaven. Charles? 
Yes, this is a favorite of Seventh-day Adventist, Revelation chapter 12, verse 7 through 9. Then war, war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, who fought back with his angels. But the dragon was defeated, and he and his angels were not allowed to stay in heaven any longer. The huge dragon was thrown out. That ancient sharp serpent called the devil or Satan that deceived the whole world. He was thrown down to earth and all his angels with him. Good news Bible. And notice what we accomplish when we join God in this cosmic conflict. Second Corinthians chapter 10 verse 4, the weapons we use in our fight are not the world's weapons, but God's power. We don't need, we don't need cannons and ships and airplanes. No guns. Powerful weapons, but God's powerful weapons, which we use to destroy strongholds. We destroy false arguments. Again, good Look news, Bible. We destroy false arguments. In other words, our job as members of the church is to correct the misrepresentations about God. All the false ideas that Satan has tried to, 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 to promote, we're there and by our lives and our speech and our understanding and our explanations, we are supposed to tear down the false arguments of Satan. I do not know if there is any other church and kindly help no. that has a clear understanding of the great controversy. No one. Nobody. None. It's Nobody. Not, it's not out there. Because they do not, then no one else really has the opportunity to present Christ in his real divine beauty as Seventh-day Adventist. No. And even though it's clear, we can see it, like the verse you just, two verses you just read to us, we can see it clearly in the Bible, but we needed the, the inner insights given to Ellen White for us to, that was the way we, yes. we got to it. We, we, otherwise, we would never have figured it out. Well, Satan will do everything that God will allow him to do to try to force us to do his will. So what does Satan do? He tries to force us to do his will. God respects our freedom. The heavenly angels must constantly prevent Satan and his angels from manipulating and forcing human beings to do his will. So what do we got here? Satan is trying to force us to do his will. So what do the angels of heaven do? Stand back, balance, <laughs> you know, that's not fair. You know, you can't, you can't you exercise undue force on these people. It's not fair. You have to give them opportunity to make free choices. Satan was the first fascist. Yeah. <laughs> I never thought about that. Just, yeah. Yeah, He's the exactly. first fascist. He's the first evolutionist. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So one of the major tasks of the heavenly angels is to hold back the forces of evil so as to give us an opportunity to make free choices. This is the work of the Holy Spirit who directs the heavenly angels. And I'm going to repeat a verse, a part of a verse that we just read a moment ago. But I'm telling you the truth, it's better for you that I go away, because if I do not go, I'm sorry, I mixed that, this is a new, a new verse. If I do not go, the helper will not come to you. But if I do go, go away, then I will send him to you, and when he comes, he will prove to the people of the world that they are wrong about sin, and about what is right, and about God's judgment. From the Good News Bible. But the Lord also told the disciples, do not leave Jerusalem until this, the power is sent to you. Because uh, the, many of the folk that this is going to go to work in Muslim countries. Yeah. And Muslims say, well, this promise was the prophet that was coming in 600 yeah. AD. Yeah. God's kingdom is based on love. There can be no coercion in love. Freedom, complete freedom, must be possible in order for the love to fully exist, in order for love to fully exist. When we pray for someone else, God has an opportunity to say to the devil, step back. I am not violating this person's freedom. I am acting in accordance with his friend's prayers. So when we pray, we actually give God permission to say to the devil, step back. 
Okay. Well, the, in the Garden of Eden, or excuse me, in Genesis chapter 1, uh, two times he says, take dominion, mm -hmm. take dominion. And there's not a, uh, says, but look out, if I don't, if you don't do it my way, I'm going to beat the cr dickens <laughs> out of you. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it's not there. Yeah. It's, but he offers you truth. He says, if you eat of the tree, you can eat of all the trees, but eat of that one, it's, it's, it's not good for you. Yeah. And, but he didn't. Say, he just says you're going to die. He didn't say I'm, how, I'm going to, how it's going to come about. He can't use coercion because anything that that smacks of that is destroys love. Yeah, yeah. Okay, Jim. And of course, then you got Malachi three six. He never changes, and a few other places. Uh, places. The the earth was dark through a misapprehension of God. The gloomy shadow might be lightened. That the gloomy shadow might be lightened. That the world might be brought back to God. Satan's deceptive power was to be broken. Now let me interrupt for a second. What do we read just above there? What we were, what's our job? Let me go back there for a second. We are to destroy false arguments. Okay? And, and, but sometimes you, you, can't, you can't shout it. You have to demonstrate it. It takes time. Yeah. It, it's, it, it's no, well, it make, I make a pronouncement and I expect you to, uh, yeah. because there are people overwhelmed with, uh, with false ideas. Satan's deceptive power was to be broken, okay? Go ahead. This could not be done by force. The exercise of force is contrary to the principles of God's government. He desired only, desires only the service of love, and love cannot be commanded. It cannot be won by force or authority. Only by love is love awakened. To know God is to love him. His character must be manifested in contrast to the character of Satan. This work only one being in all the universe could do. Only he who knew the height and depth of the love of God could make it known. Upon the world's dark night, the sun of righteousness must rise with healing in his wings. Malachi 4 Verse 2, and also Desire of Ages, uh, 22. page 22. Okay, consider this statement carefully. It is a part of God's plan to grant us, in answer to the prayer of faith, that which he would not bestow did we not thus ask. That's from the okay, so let's, prophecy. Okay, thank you. Let's be clear about this. Does it mean that God is up there stingy and he doesn't want to help us, but if we really demand it, he'll do it? No. What it's saying here is God is allowed to do, God does things if we pray for it. And he can tell the devil, step back, let me do this because they've, they have asked me to do it. That's part of God's plan. So what kind of example of Jesus teach us about prayers of intercession? Jesus had a specific time and a specific place, or I should say specific, specific places, where he offered prayer to God. And you can read about that in several places in Luke, Luke 3.21, 5.16, and 9.18. But I like this one. Just before he chose his disciples, Jesus spent the entire night in mm. prayer to his Father. Luke 6.12. At the time, Jesus went up a hill to pray and spent the whole night there praying to God. Goodness, Bible. Can you guess what they were talking about that night? Jesus says, Father, tomorrow I'm going to choose my disciples. Hmm. Can you help me? Show me which ones to choose and which ones not to choose. And then he ended up with Judas there. Well, he, wasn't, he wasn't even, it, yeah. he wasn't really chosen. He just no, he got, wasn't he chosen. brought himself Joined. in. But the Lord didn't say, don't follow me. He told some other people after he healed them, no, you go to your people, speak. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, Judas, he did not. Remember that each day Jesus had a plan set out for his day that had been worked out between himself and his father in his nighttime prayers. Jesus did, Jesus did not use his divine power for his own benefit or performing miracles while on this earth. He followed his Father's instructions, and God-given power was used as needed. And if you read uh, the chapter that talks about what Jesus said to his disciples in the upper room, just before they went out to the Garden of Gethsemane, it will say in there, 
he did not exercise any power that we couldn't exercise if we had the same relationship to God that he had. Mm. Amazing. Mm -hmm. So, how did Jesus relate to Peter in the upper room after Peter had boasted that he would follow his Lord all the way to death? Luke 22, 31 to 34. Simon, Simon, listen. Satan has received permission to test all of you, to separate the good from the bad as a farmer separates the wheat from, wheat from the chaff. But I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith will not fail. And when you turn back to me, you must strengthen your brothers. Peter answered, Lord, I'm ready to go to prison with you and to die with you. I tell you, Peter, Jesus said, the cock, the cock will not crow tonight until you have said three times that you do not know me. Mm. I mean, I don't know whether the other disciples were kind of looking funny at Peter at that point in time. Given what we know about the great controversy and Satan's work, we can be sure that Satan was doing everything he possibly could to destroy Peter's influence and to prevent him from taking his intended place in the future Christian church. From that Thursday night, here's what I want you, a question I have for you to think about. From that Thursday night, when Peter boasted so proudly unto Jesus, until Jesus arrived in, in heaven, was only three days. Three days later, Jesus is back in heaven. Did Jesus continue to pray for Peter in heaven? Yeah, I think he probably did. I can tell you whether or not he did. Just listen. Even from his throne in heaven, does he pray for us? Jim? Zechariah 3, 1 to 5. In another vision, the Lord showed me the high priest Joshua standing before the angel of the Lord. And there, beside Joshua, stood Satan, ready to bring an accusation against him. I'm going to interrupt for a second again. Charles has already read us uh, Revelation 12, 7 and 9. If you read on there, Satan is called the accuser okay, of the brethren. The brethren. Here's the exact place where that happens. Okay. The angel of the Lord said to Satan, May the Lord condemn you, Satan. May the Lord who loves Jerusalem condemn you. This man is like a stick snatched from the fire. Joshua was standing there wearing filthy clothes. The angel said to his heavenly attendants, Take away the filth filthy clothes this man is wearing. I'm, then, I'm going to interrupt there for a second again. Many of our Christian friends seem to imply, they don't just openly say this, but they seem to imply that you don't need to take off your dirty clothes. Christ's righteousness will just cover you. Now you can go on practicing your sinful ways. Just ask the Lord to forgive you every once in a while so he'll take care of it. No. What does Jesus, what does is, what is Zechariah tell us? Take off yeah. the there's filthy lot, clothes. There's a lot of mis... A lack of logic in a lot of theology. Yeah. Uh, where were we? Take away, uh, take the, away the filthy, filthy clothes. clothes this man is wearing. Then he said to Joshua, I have taken away your sin and will give you new clothes to wear. He commanded the attendants to put a clean turban on Joshua's head. They did so, and then they put the new clothes on him while the angel of the Lord stood there. Good News Bible. Now, if you read over in Daniel 7, you will discover that there's a, there's a judgment scene taking place in heaven. And that will be, in fact, that's what's going on in heaven right now. God the Father is sitting as in the th on the throne. Satan is bringing his accusations against us. Now, that doesn't mean he's in heaven. God is omnipresent. Satan can be right here and make his accusations known to God in heaven. He doesn't have to go to heaven, so it's not like Satan is there. He, just, he can make his accusations from wherever he is. And, but what happens then? Satan, re I mean, Christ responds and says, if, if we are faithful followers of him, no, what you're saying about that person may be true, but that's not the whole story. This person is making an honest effort to leave his sins behind, to become more like me. He's safe to save. And so that's what we're, we're seeing here. Every one of us must, with humility, acknowledge our total dependence upon God when we pray but we must never give up 
praying. The Apostle Paul also prayed for his many friends in the various churches that he helped to establish. One excellent example of that is found in Ephesians 1, 15 to 21. Ephesians 1, 15 begins with some very puzzling words. Why would Paul, who had spent three years in Ephesus, say, for this reason, ever since I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus. That doesn't make sense, does it? He spent three years there working with these people. And well, oh, I heard about your faith. Well, uh, Paul had worked very closely with the Ephesian brethren for three years. But scholars recognize that the book of Ephesians was not written only to the Ephesian church. In fact, that little expression, uh, Ephesus, in the beginning, to the Ephesians, isn't there in the oldest documents. But if Ephesus became the circulation center for the early church. So when Paul sent a letter to them, he expected that they would make copies and send it out to all the other churches. So Paul, 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 is, Paul is thinking of all the churches in in, in Asia Minor, it was called then, Western Turkey, we would call it today, as he, as he wrote these words, and that's why he, he said, I've heard about your faith. Um, instead, it was intended to be an encyclical. That means that while the letter went to the church at Ephesus, it was to be copied by them and sent to all the other churches that Paul had started to, or built up. Thus, in this letter, Paul was addressing all church members wherever they were located. Kerry? I'm reading from Ephesians 1, verses 15 to 21. For this reason, ever since I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all God's people, I have not stopped giving thanks to God for you. I remember you in my prayers and asked God, the, the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, to give you the Spirit, who will make you wise and reveal God to you so that you will know him. I ask that your minds may be open to see his light so that you will know what is the hope to which he has called you, how rich are the wonderful blessings he promises his people, and how very great is his power at work in us who believe. This power working in us is the same as the mighty strength which he used when he raised Christ from death and seated him at his right hand, at his right side rather in the heavenly world. Can I interrupt there for just a second? Paul is saying, if you are willing to work with Christ, if you're willing to pray for the salvation of the people around you, then God says, I will work with you and I have this, the, the uh, power I have to use in assisting you is the same power that raised Jesus from the dead and took him to heaven. Imagine that. We could have access to that kind of power. Okay, Christ rules there above all heavenly rulers, authorities, powers, and lords. He has a title superior to all titles of authority in this world and in the next. And that's mm. the Good News Bible. And notice what Paul prayed for. He prayed for the Holy Spirit in that passage to come upon them so that they would have a better knowledge of God. The Holy Spirit comes, and what does he bring to us? <clears throat> A better knowledge of God and how, who gave us the Bible who's responsible for the production of the whole all of Scripture all Scripture Holy is Spirit. given by the inspiration of God oh. yep yeah he prayed for their minds to be open so that they could understand more clearly what plans God had for them consider also Paul's prayer for the Philippian church members it is important to recognize that the letters to the Ephesians and Colossians were written by Paul from prison in Rome. He's in prison. We believe that the letter to the Philippians was written even later, just before he expected to be released from the prison in Rome. Charles? Philippians chapter 1, verses 3 through 11. I thank my God for you every time I think of you, and every time I pray for you all. I pray with joy because of the way in which you have helped me in the work of the gospel from the very first day until now. And so I'm sure that God, who began this good work in you, will carry it on until it is finished on the day of Christ Jesus. 
you are always in my heart and so it is only right for me to feel as I do about you. For I have all shared with no, you, you have all shared with me in this privilege that God has given me, both now and I am that I am in prison, and also while I was free to defend the gospel and establish it firmly. God is my witness that I am telling the truth when I say that my deep feeling for you all comes from the heart of Christ Jesus himself. I pray that your love will keep on growing more and more together with true knowledge and perfect judgment so that you will be able to choose what is best. Then you will be free from all the impurity and blame on the day of Christ. Your lives will be filled with the truly good qualities in which only Jesus Christ can produce for the glory and praise of God. Amen. Amen. Well, could these words of Paul be spoken about us and our churches in the 21st century? How would you like to have Paul praying for you? Hmm. Another example of a great intercessory prayer is the story of Daniel. Based on Jeremiah 25, 11, we should read that. This whole land will be left in ruins and will be a shocking sight and the neighboring nations will serve the king of Babylonia for 70 years. And also in chapter 29, verse 11, let me just zoom over there really quick. Jeremiah 29, 11. I'm not going to zoom over there as fast as I thought I would. These are long chapters. Mm -hmm. There we go. We're getting there. <clears throat> okay. Hold on here. It's actually 10. I'm sorry, 29.10. The Lord says, When Babylonia's 70 years are over, I will show my concern for you and keep my promise to bring you back home. So, uh, Daniel is, it has, knows about those years. He's counted those years. He has lived through every one of those years. He has lived through all that time serving the, the, the nation of Babylonia. He's living, now living two years serving the, 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 the emperor of Medo-Persia. Now Daniel already knew that God was going to allow the nation of Judea to be in captivity for 70 years. Daniel was then quite elderly and knew that 70 year period would be coming to a close. So he decided the time had come for him to fast and pray to see if he could get more details about God's plan for his people. I mean, Daniel must have been, I'm, I'm sure he was really struggling with, with this. And so we have these words, Daniel 10, verses 4 to 14. On the 24th day of the first month of the year, I was standing on the bank of the mighty river Tigris. I looked up and saw someone who was wearing linen clothes and a belt of fine gold. His body shone like a jewel. His face was as bright as a flash of lightning, and his eyes blazed like fire. His arms and legs shone like polished bronze, and his voice sounded like the roar of a great crowd. And if you go over and read Revelation 1, 13, the Jesus who comes and presents himself to John is almost the same exactly as this here in Daniel. I was the only one who saw the vision. Those who were with me did not see anything, but they were terrified and ran and hid. I don't know whether they heard something, they saw a bright light or whatever. They were scared. I was left there alone watching this amazing vision. I had no strength left, and my face was so changed that no one could have recognized me. When I heard his voice, I fell to the ground unconscious and lay there face downwards. Then a hand took hold of me and raised me to my hands and knees. I was still trembling. The angel said to me, Daniel, God loves you. Imagine God coming to you and that's the first thing he says to you. Daniel, God loves you. Stand up and listen carefully to what I'm going to say. I have been sent to you. 
When he had said this, I stood up still trembling. Then he said, Daniel, don't be afraid. God has heard your prayers ever since the first day you decided to humble yourself in order to gain understanding. I have come in answer to your prayer. Wow. The angel prince, notice this, this terminology here, the angel prince of the kingdom of Persia opposed me for 21 days. Then Michael. Well, this is Satan himself. Yeah, exactly. Then Michael, one of the chief angels, came to help me because I had been left there alone in Persia. I have come to make you understand what will happen to your people in the future. This is a vision about the future. And I like those words because there's so many biblical critics that say not even God can predict the future. Well, he says these words are about what? Future. The future. We need to understand several things very clearly in order to under interpret this passage. First of all, Cyrus was the king of the Persian Empire. The Bible speaks of the prince of this world as being Satan himself. I'm going to read two verses, John 12, 31. Now is the time for this world to be judged. Now the ruler of this world will be overthrown. When I'm ruler of this world will be overthrown. Let me go back here. Look at, look at chapter 1430. I cannot talk with you much longer because the ruler of this world is coming. He has no power over me, and so forth and so forth. So twice, Jesus himself called Satan what? Prince of this world. The ruler of this, ruler world. Of this world. So if the prince of Persia represents Satan, then who is Michael? Michael is Christ himself. The term Michael means who is like God. Or it could be, if they didn't have question marks in their text in those days, so it could be a statement, the one who is like God. That expression is used five times in the Bible. Revelation 12, 7, Jude 9, Daniel 11, 13, and 21, and Daniel 12, 1. In each of these cases, the one, quote, who is like God, namely Jesus Christ, is in direct conflict with the devil. So, why do you suppose Jesus would be called Michael when he's in direct conflict with the devil? What does Michael mean again? It's like God. So here you have two people, one who claims to be God and the one who, other one who is really like God. The one that claims it is a creature. Yeah, yeah, exactly. He's not God. So God specifically said, at these times, I want to be clear, this one, this one over here, not that one that claims to be God, but this one over here is the one who is really like God. As a director working through the Holy Spirit and all of the angels, his ultimate goal is to completely eliminate and destroy the influence of Satan and his evil angels on the lives of human beings. It's coming. Try to imagine what exactly was happening when Daniel was told that Jesus himself had come to restrain or beat back the devil to prevent him from forcing the emperor of Persia to damage or destroy God's people. So again, we have the same story here, don't we? What's, what's God doing here? What's God's, well, what is Christ doing here? Protecting. Daniel has been praying and fasting for three weeks. And that's not the only reason. God planned to do this before, but in this case, Daniel is praying. And so what does God do? What do we say his job was? To prevent, is that the word, or restrain? Stop the devil. Yeah. Restrain. Step back. I have a work to do here. People are asking me to do it. I'm not forcing myself on anybody, but Satan, you're trying to force yourself on them, and I forbid it. Step back. And God uh, is, is their protector. Yeah. That's, Mike, uh, that's Daniel 12, 1. Mm -hmm. Michael, who is your protector? Yeah. Uh, is it? Well, so finally we need to make another important point about prayer. Prayers need to be focused. We sometimes teach our children to pray for all the call porters and missionaries, which, which is a nice thought, but it's not God's plan. Jesus prayed specifically for Peter. Paul prayed for his churches and no doubt thought of individuals in each of those churches as he was doing so. He prayed for his young colleagues, Timothy. Think about his 
his letters to Timothy and Titus and even John Mark. Okay? Job 16, 21. Job said, I want someone to plead with God for me as one pleads for a friend. Many years later, the children of Israel had asked to be given a king like the nations around them. Samuel tried to prevent this because he knew the evils that would result. But after the Lord told Samuel to go ahead and give them a king, God still made a solemn promise. Okay, Jim, is that yours? 1 Samuel 12, 22 to 24. An address to the children of Israel after they demanded a king. The Lord made a solemn promise, and he will not abandon you, for he has decided to make you his own people. As for me, the Lord forbid that I should sin against him by no longer praying for you. Instead, I will teach you what is good and right for you to do. Obey the Lord and serve him faithfully with all your heart. Remember the great things he has done for you. Good News Bible. Yeah. So here's Samuel. With his, you, can, you, can, you can almost hear the tears in his voice saying, you know, this is not the right thing to do. But despite that, God is still with you, and I will keep praying for you even though you're making bad choices here. So what should be the relationship between our praying for family and friends and our working for them through our example and our teachings? Well, in 1 John 5, 14 to 16, which we read at the beginning of this lesson, God directs us to be constantly on watch for those around us committing sin. We should pray for them that they be forgiven. And this, very, this is very important because Ellen White told us, Carrie, is that yours? Oh, no, I don't have it marked. No. But. Yeah. 26, Satan. Say, oh, she told us, well, yeah, okay, I'll read that. Just that one section there, I guess. Yeah. Satan cannot endure to have his powerful rival appealed to, for he fears and trembles before his strength and majesty. At the sound of fervent prayer, Satan's whole host trembles. At the sound of fervent prayer, Satan's whole host trembles. Spiritual gifts. That was written way back in 1864. Yeah. One of the puzzling things found in 1 John 5, 16 is the idea that there are some sins which lead to death while there are other sins which do not lead to death. What does that mean? What kind of sins lead to death? Deliberate. Yeah. What is sometimes called the unpardonable sin happens when a person has refused to listen to God's advice for so long that he can no longer hear God, and God must finally give up on him or her and let him or her reap the awful results of his or her choices. Okay? Who's next? Am I out of order? It's me. Okay. It is part of God's plan to grant us, in answer to the prayer of faith, that which he would not bestow, did we not thus ask. Ellen White, Great Controversy, page 525. What, what is, what's, what's God saying to us there? There are things that God wants to do that he doesn't do because he, he refuses to allow Satan to claim that he is forcing. And so God waits for us to pray. He waits for us to step in. He, he, he chooses to work with us. And what happens if we're not willing to work with him? He just lets you... Some, th some things don't happen. Well, look at Matthew 16, 17 to 20 as an example of some of these ideas. Good for you, Simon, son of John, answered Jesus. For this truth did not come to you from any human being, but it was given to you directly by my Father in heaven. Okay, I'm going to interrupt for there, there for a second. Many of you out there, along with those of us here, realize that over in Luke chapter 18, starting with verse 31, he says basically the same thing that he's saying right here. And none of the disciples knew what in the world he was talking about. 
So how did, how did, how did Matthew know it way back here? And he seems to have forgotten it when there, well, I think there's a very clear reason. I could be wrong, but this is my theory. On that last journey to Jerusalem, they are traveling, it's time for Passover almost to start. Jesus and his disciples are, um, are traveling with a huge crowd of people. And those people, along with the disciples, are absolutely certain that Jesus is going up to Jerusalem. And what's going to happen? They'll crown him the king. They're going to crown him king. And the idea that something else could happen to Jesus was completely, I mean, anything like that, just com not, a, not a ghost of a chance that that could happen. And to the icing of the cream of the ice cream, icing, I guess, however it's said, is he waits for four days till Lazarus is dead, dead for four days. And all these great throngs of people say, this is the man. Yep. He doesn't want to be the Messiah. We will make him by force yep. the king. I mean, look, he, he can raise people from that. If we yeah, go out right. with our army and someone's killed on the battlefield, he'll just raise yeah. them to life again. Okay, go ahead. <sighs> what word? And so I tell you, Peter. Uh, let's see. And so I tell you, Peter, you are a rock. Huh? Does it say pebble in some places or what? I know well, this is the, good news. The word for rock here is a, is a small stone that you could pick up and throw. Yeah, okay. So it's a, it's a small, it's not a huge rock. It's a, like pebble, I think, in that, yeah. other places it says. And on this rock foundation, and that's he the, was pointing to himself, I want yes, to think. Yeah, that's, a, that's a, a big, solid rock that nobody can move. And that would be on... Was he even pointing toward himself, saying, on, on this I, rock? I, I don't know. It could be he's pointing to himself or he's talking about the truth that he's, that he's speaking right truth here. Truth is the rock. And yeah. I am the way, the truth, the life. Exactly. It's still going back to him yeah. and not to Peter and thus not to the Catholic Church. Yeah. Okay. We're going to see that. All right. Um, and on this rock foundation, I will build my church and not even death will ever be able to overcome it. I'll give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. What you prohibit on earth will be prohibited in heaven. And what you permit on earth will be permitted in heaven. Then Jesus ordered his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. Wow. Jesus ordered his disciples. He's been sending them out on, on missions to travel through Galilee. That's all us past. He's already done with that. And now he's telling him, don't tell anybody I'm the Messiah? What's going on here? Well, many, of course, our Roman Catholic friends look at this verse and they say, you see, this is our key verse. The keys of the kingdom have been handed to Peter, right? Well, why are these cares given exclusively, these keys given exclusively to Peter? If you go over a couple of chapters to Matthew 18, verses 18 and 19, it says, And so, so I tell all of you what you prohibit on earth will be prohibited in heaven, and what you permit on earth will be permitted in heaven. And I tell you more, whenever two or three of, two of you are on earth agree about anything you pray for, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. So any two of you, not just Peter with his keys, Clearly, these prayers were to be answered on behalf of all the disciples. So God must be incredibly busy answering prayers. Of course, he has the Holy Spirit and all the heavenly angels to assist him. But we are specifically instructed to keep your wants. No, I'm sorry. That's yours, Jim. Keep your wants, your joys, your sorrows, your cares, and your fears before God. You cannot burden him. You cannot weary him. He who numbers the hairs of your head is not indifferent to the wants of his children. The Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy, James 5, 11. His heart of love is touched by our sorrows and even by our utterances of them. Take to him everything that perplexes the mind. Nothing is too great for him to bear. For he holds up worlds, he rules over all the affairs of the universe. Nothing that is in any way concerns him. Our peace is too small for him 
to notice. There is no chapter in our experience too dark for him to read. There is no perplexity too difficult for him to unravel. No calamity can befall the least of his children. No anxiety harass the soul. No joy cheer. No sincere prayer escape the lips of which our Heavenly Father is unobservant or in which he takes no immediate interest. He healeth the broken heart and bindeth up their wounds. Psalms 147.3 The relations between the relations between God and each soul are as distinct and of and full as those excuse me as though there were not another soul upon the earth to share his watch care, not another soul for whom he gave his beloved son. Ellen White, Steps of Christ, page one hundred. Wow. Ministering Imagine angels. Imagine that. Right. Administering angels waiting about the throne to instantly obey the mandate of Jesus Christ to answer every prayer offered in earnest, living faith. Ellen White, Selected Messages, Book 2, page 377. Wow. Wow. I mean, imagine. God gives us his attention if we pray earnestly and in faith as if there was no one else on this world or anywhere else in the universe for that matter, that he, that he has to focus his attention on. He focuses right on us. If we pray in accordance with his will, there's an angel immediately available to carry out God's will in cooperation with us. Hmm. Carrie, how should this impact our churches today? <clears throat> Just as soon as a church is organized, let the minister set the members at work. Wow. <clears throat> They will need to be taught how to labor successfully. Let the minister devote more of his time to educating than to preaching. <clears throat> Pardon me. <clears throat> Let him teach the people how to give to others the knowledge they have received. While the new converts should be taught to ask counsel from those more experienced in the work, they should also be taught not to put the minister in the place of God. Ministers are but human beings, men compassed with infirmities. Christ is the one to whom we are to look for guidance. That's from Testimonies, Volume 7, <clears throat> page 20, paragraph 1. There are times when it is fitting for our ministers to give on the Sabbath in our churches short discourses full of the life and love of Christ. But the church members are not to expect a sermon every Sabbath. <laughs> it's from Testimonies, Volume 7, 19, 2. How about that? I've never read that before anywhere. How about that? Yeah. So what's the pastor's... The pastor's <laughs> job is to teach us how to witness and to get the whole church at work. Now, once in a while, he's supposed to give a sermon. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Paul spent a lot of time in prison. After four or five years in prison, first in Palestine and then in Rome, imagine how he felt when he realized that church members in various places were praying for him. He really appreciated those prayers. Um, let, let me just read a couple of those places. Look at Philippians 1.19. Because I know that by means of your prayers and the help which comes from the Spirit of, Christ, of Jesus Christ, I shall be set free. I mean, he says, you are praying for it, God will make it happen. Look at Colossians 4, 2 and 3. Be persistent in prayer and keep alert as you pray, giving thanks to God. At the same time, pray also for us so that God will give us a good opportunity to preach his message about the secret of Christ. For that is why I am now in prison. Pray then that I may speak as I should in such a way as to make it clear. And if we had time to go back and review Paul's life, he was so persuasive in his teachings, that some of, many of the household of Nero were convinced to be Christians. Mm. Do you have a clear understanding about how the great controversy affects you personally as, as Bible-believing Christians? We, we, be, we believe that the great controversy has already been won by the life and death of Jesus. Furthermore, we know that ultimately God will win. But there will be a lot of trouble between now and then. Should we be praying every day for those we care about? 
So what exactly is the role of our prayers? Charles? Prayer is the opening of the heart to God as to a friend. Not that it is necessary in order to make known to God what we are, but in order to enable us to receive Him. Prayer does not bring God down to us, but brings us up to Him. Ellen White, Steps to Christ, page 93, paragraph 2. Wow, that's a marvelous yes. statement. Yeah. Wow. Yes. Prayer is our means of staying in constant contact and communion with God. Mm -hmm. We need God's help every moment to hold back the forces of evil from overcoming us. God will not use excessive force. However, he allows us the freedom to make free choices. And I want to emphasize again, how does God make it possible for us to have free choices? Who doesn't want us to have free choice? The adversary. Yeah. Yeah. The enemy. Satan. Satan. So God comes back and he comes along and he says, step back, Satan. Leave this person alone. Give them a moment. Give them time to make free choice. And as we said earlier, when we pray for others, it allows God to step in and do things that for, for that individual or group without violating their freedom in any way. Um, if we are daily being changed into God's image, our prayers will come to be more and more in line with God's will for our lives and the lives of our friends. We can claim God's promises. Mm. I will tell you that, uh, and I mentioned this earlier, one time I was invited to a cocktail party and didn't believe it, didn't have any idea, wasn't sure I should go, but the man said, please, you know, this is my lab instructor, I wanted to get a good grade. And he said, we have other things to drink. You don't have to drink alcohol. But I got there, and under very unusual circumstances, this young woman turned to me and my wife. We were standing there. And she says, I have a question for you. She says, if I'm 500 miles away from somebody, a friend or relative, and that person is in a serious accident and is in the hospital on the verge of death, cannot speak on the telephone or anything like that, and I pray for him, will it make a difference? This is the only cocktail party I've ever been in my life. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so here's our question here. Well, so I tried to explain to her about the great controversy and a long time later she told me, you know what? I have been asking that same question to everybody who I thought knew anything about the Bible or about God for seven years and you are the first person who gave me a reasonable answer. Yeah. Hmm. So we have the answers. We know about the great controversy. Think for a moment about that very critical time in the plan of salvation when Jesus took his disciples out to the Garden of Gethsemane the night before he was crucified. Jesus himself was offered, offering prayers with deep sighs and tears, even sweating blood. He wished so desperately that his disciples would be praying for him also. Of course, we know that three times he came back to Peter, James, and John. Well, these were the three whom he took a little farther yes. than the other. They were special to him. Yes. And it must have really, truly broken his heart to see these guys fell asleep when he needed sleeping. them the most. Every time he came back to them, they were yeah. sleeping. Well, how do you suppose Peter, James, and John felt about that experience later as they thought back on it? <laughs> do you think any of the other disciples came to them and said, well, what happened with you and Jesus there in the garden? Uh, we were sleeping. <laughs> <laughs> we <don't> know. <laughs> you know, what would you say? Was the problem that they allowed themselves to be overcome by Satan, or were they just tired? Well, maybe Satan used tiredness. Jesus desperately needed all the help and support he could get at that point in time. And ultimately, he ended up walking the path alone. So what should be our general guidelines for prayer? First, we need to have a time every day specifically set apart for prayer. Jesus often went out first thing in the morning to speak with his Father and plan for the day. Second, Jesus had a specific place where he prayed. There were no doubt special spots in each of the towns or villages where he spent time. 
Those were places where he could have some privacy and pray to his Father. Third, Jesus also prayed openly and out loud. Did he want the devil to know what he was praying about? Apparently some of his prayers, even in the Garden of Gethsemane, were out loud. Look at these words, Matthew 26, 39. He went a little further on, after leaving the three disciples there, threw himself face downwards on the ground and prayed, My Father, if it is possible, take this cup of suffering away from me, yet not what I want, but what you want. Wow. Um, and, but St. Paul also says, pray unceasingly. Mm -hmm. um, I meditate on thy law day and night. During Ramadan, a friend of mine, a Muslim lady, asked me, we pray five times a day, how about you? This is we Christians play unceasingly. We pray all the time, even when we are driving. Mm -hmm. We can be in the presence of the Lord Yep, in prayer. Very good. Okay, well, the book of Hebrews says that he offered pr prayers and supplications with vehement cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death. Some, some people feel that it is safer to be silent when one's prayers, one's praise, because they do not want the devil to know what they're thinking and saying. But God, through Ellen White, advises Learn to play aloud where only God can hear you. Review and Herald, April 22, 1884. And why would God tell us that? Praying out loud makes it easier for us to stay focused on what we are praying about. And we need not worry about Satan's interference because... At the sound of fervent prayer, Satan's whole host trembles. Ellen White, Testimonies of the Church, Volume 1, page 346. Are you prepared to set aside a specific time and place to pray daily and watch for God's answers? Make a list of those for whom you are praying and see what happens. It may be appropriate when we are praying for a particular individual or group to ask others to join us in praying for them. Why do not believers feel a deeper, more earnest concern for those who are out of Christ? Why do not two or three meet together and plead with God for the salvation of some special one and then for still another one? Testimonies for the Church, Volume 7. Would you like to be a partner with God? Would you like to see Him perform miracles as a result of your prayers? The greatest miracle that could possibly happen is when a sinner comes back to God. Let's pray. Our kind and wonderful Father, we thank you for these lessons which are such a challenge, for the truths that are clearly presented here, for the opportunities we have to work, work with you May we take up this challenge. May we begin to experience what you want us to experience, the marvelous opportunities that are open to us on a day-by-day -day basis if you just show us uh, where they're located and what we should do. May that be our experience as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.